Oh, hey, Charles. Oh, hey. Oh man, I'm so glad you're here. You got a second to look at something? Yeah, sure, what's up? It's that design pattern you showed me the other day, the state pattern. I get it in theory, but I'm having trouble implementing it. Oh, yeah. You want me to walk you through it again? Oh man, that would be awesome. Of course, man, always happy to help. Let me just grab a chair. All right, so show me the project and what you have so far. Right, so I'm trying to use the state pattern to implement turn-based combat. So far, all I have is this simple battle scene. It starts with some dialogue and then moves into a combat phase. I get to go first, so I'll go ahead and attack, and then my opponent will go, and it'll switch back and forth until one of us wins. State pattern seems like a good fit for this. Yeah, I think so too. I've got one class called battle system that's responsible for all the behavior, keeps track of the battle and changes its behavior based on the current state. The problem is that my implementation keeps track of state using an enum. Right, and that doesn't scale well at all. No, unfortunately it doesn't. All of my behavior logic has to explicitly account for every state, which means I have to add a bunch of confusing if statements throughout my code. And that's the very problem the state pattern solves. Now, that video you sent me the other day describes the pattern really well, but I think I need to see it in action in order to really grasp it. Well, why don't we dive right in then? We can start with a plan. We need to encapsulate each state and its behavior. So the first thing we'll do is create an abstract class called state. Then we'll create another abstract class called state machine that's responsible for keeping track of the current state we'll have the battle system implement this class. Once that's in place, we'll migrate all of the behavior out of battle system and into individual state classes. And we'll replace all that logic with calls to the current state. How does that sound? I love it. Great, let's get to work. So like I said, the first step is to create a new class that we're going to call state. And we're gonna make this class abstract because we need our future states to implement it and to implement methods that represent the behaviors that our states are going to be responsible for. Now, to determine what those are, we're going to need to switch back to the battle system, and let's minimize some of these regions. We're going to focus on the execution region. Now, this sort of gives us a hint of what our states are currently responsible for, and that's going to be handling the on attack button and on heal buttons for now. As we can see by this if statement, the only states that are responsible for handling these buttons is the player turn state. So when we go to implement the player turn state class, we're going to have to add some logic to handle those buttons. Apart from that, each state is going to have some sort of logic that fires whenever it's set to the current state on the system. So with all of that in mind, let's go back to the abstract state class. And we're going to add three methods that each state is going to have to implement. And that's going to be a start method, an attack method, and a heal method. Some things to note is that each one is going to have to be virtual, so it can be overridden by the deriving class. And each one is going to have to return an I enumerator because we're going to call them as coroutines. And by default, we'll just have them yield break. That way, we don't actually have to go and implement them in every class. If they're not overridden, uh, then they'll just go ahead and yield break by default. Hey, I was wondering about this last time. Is it okay to have methods called attack and heal? Doesn't that go against the solid principles or something? That's a good point. It actually does break the open-close principle, which states that a class should be open for extension but close to modification. Right, because I have to modify the code in order to add new states. Exactly. So what's the deal? Is there something wrong with the code? Well, normally I'd say yes, but state machines are a special case because they're supposed to be finite. If we open up our code to extension, then anyone can add a state at runtime. By hard coding our states, we guarantee that our state machine stays finite at the code level. Hmm, okay, Th that makes sense. Also, keep in mind that this is just one approach to the state pattern. There are other more sophisticated implementations, like uh, Unity's animation controller, that do support adding states at runtime. But honestly, for what we're doing here, we don't really need anything that complicated. Gotcha. All right, that's all I wanted to know. Next, just to kind of keep things separate, we're going to add a new class. Uh, we're going to call this state machine. 
Now, of course, the logic we're about to add, we could add it directly to the battle system, but just to make this easy to follow, we're gonna put it into its own abstract state machine class and then have the battle system implement this. So first, unlike our current implementation that keeps track of the state with an enum, the state machine abstract class is actually going to keep track of a state object, which for now we'll make protected so that the deriving class can delegate behavior down to the current state. And then we'll add a public function called set state that takes in a state and uses it to set the current state of the state machine. Now, something that's important to note here is that some implementations have the state machine responsible for changing its own internal state. But in this case, our derived state classes will take on that responsibility. Now, another thing to note is that we want each state's start method to be triggered whenever we set the state of the machine. So we'll go ahead and have this implement the mono behavior class so that we can call start coroutine and pass in state dot start like so. So that's pretty much all we have to do to lay down the groundwork. The next step is to actually start implementing all of our behaviors. So first we'll head on over to the battle system class again, and we'll have the battle system actually implement the state machine class, which remember derives from mono behavior. And then we can start delegating these behaviors down to the current state. And that would be the attack and heal behaviors. We'll replace this player attack method with a call to state.attack. And likewise, the player heal method, now that behavior will get pushed down to the actual state class. Perfect. So now all of the behavior is being delegated to the abstract state classes. Now we actually have to start implementing those classes with our existing behaviors. So we'll just minimize this region and we'll take a focused look at the state specific behaviors region which as you'd expect contains all of our state specific behaviors. And now it's just a matter of migrating each one out into its own class. So let's start with an easy one. We will do the begin battle state. So I'm gonna copy all this. We'll create a new class. We'll call it uh, begin, have it implement state. And then we're going to override the start method because that's the only behavior that the begin state is responsible for. And right off the bat, you can see we've already run into our first little snag. The begin logic actually depends on being able to access the interface and the enemy. So there are a couple ways to handle this. For one, we can pass the battle system into each of the state's uh, behavioral methods. Or a little easier approach is to just pass it in on the constructor and have a protected field that we can reference in the deriving classes. So we'll just go ahead and update the state class to have a reference to battle system that we will uh, initialized from a public constructor. Perfect. So now if we go back up to the begin method, we can see that this is now complaining because we need to implement that constructor. And now we can actually reference the interface directly from the battle system, as well as the enemy. Perfect. Next, we haven't cleared up all of our errors just yet. We can see here that there's still some leftover state logic from the battle system class, but instead of doing all this, what we're gonna do is call battle system dot set state, and we're gonna pass in a new player turn object, which we haven't created yet, and we're gonna pass in the battle system. This player turn object is again gonna be another state. So we can use some IntelliSense to quickly generate that class. And we'll go ahead and just have it call the base constructor. Also move it out into its own class file. So just like that, we're already ready to start writing the next state and that's the player turn. So again, we're gonna switch back to the battle system. We'll minimize the begin battle method for now since we've already migrated that behavior. And actually before we jump on to the next bit of behavior, let's scroll up to the execution region. We can see this logic that calls the begin battle method. Now, instead of calling begin battle, what we can do is call set state and pass in a new begin state class, passing in this, which is the battle system. And of course, this will trigger the begin state's start method in a coroutine, as well as setting it to the current state. And if we scroll down to the state specific behaviors region again, we can see that we no longer have any need for this method. It's all been migrated out 
So I'll just get rid of it. So we can see a little bit of progress. All right, next up, we've got the player turn and the player turn has pretty much all the main behavior for now. We can see that there's uh, this bit of logic that should get executed on the start. Then we have the player attack and then the player heal functionality. So we'll grab that all one by one, switch back to player churn. We're going to override the start method, paste in this logic. And again, same issue we had before. We just need to call battlesystem.interface, and that's going to set the dialog to say choose an action. Next, we'll do the player attack logic. So we'll copy this, go back to player turn class, override the attack method, and then paste that in. Again, update all of the references to variables on the battle state. And we can see again that we're in a position to implement two more states. We've got end game and enemy turn. So in this case, if is dead is true, that means that the enemy is dead. So we're actually going to call battle system dot set state and pass in a new one state. And if the player is not dead, then we're just going to switch the turn over to the enemy's turn. So we'll call battle system dot set state and pass in a new enemy turn state class. Of course, neither of these have been implemented, so we'll go ahead and do that with IntelliSense. Just like before, make sure to use the constructor on the base class. and then put these into their own class files. All right, so now we're gonna go back to the battle system class and do the same thing for player heal. So we'll copy this logic from this method, go back to player turn class and override heal. Paste in the logic, make a reference to battle system .interface, battle system player. And just like before, in the case of a heal, you can't win or lose. So what'll happen is we'll just call battlesystem.setState and pass in again a new enemy turn. So we can just pass the turn on to the enemy. And with that, we have completed the player turn state class. This is definitely the most complicated one because it ha it's responsible for the most behavior. So the last three should be much simpler. But before we jump into those, we can actually get rid of these player heal, player attack, and player turn methods. Now we're throwing an error right here because the enemy turn actually used to make a call to the player turn method, but we're about to yank this code out. So uh, in a second, it won't even matter. So let's copy this. We're gonna go to the enemy turn, and this logic only gets called on the start method since it's uh, AI driven. It simply doesn't attack, waits a second, and then switches the turn based on whether or not the player died. So we're gonna do all the same things that we did in the previous state classes. This time, if is dead is true, in the context of an enemy turn, that means that the player actually died. So what we'll do is we'll call battle system dot set state and we'll call a new lost state class. And if the player survives it, then of course we're just gonna set the state to the player turn. Just like before, we'll go ahead and implement lost. And move it to its own class file. Now we'll go back to the battle system and we can remove the enemy turn method since we've already migrated that out of the battle system class. As we can see, we're at our last state here. And what we were doing was handling winning and losing all in the same method. But in this case, we have two separate states. So what I'll go ahead and do is copy the one logic out. We'll switch to the one state class, override the start method, and paste in this logic that sets the dialog text to say you won the battle. 
And same thing for the lost state. We're going to just copy this you were defeated text and move it to the lost state. Of course, we're going to have to override start. And then we'll paste that in and yield break. And we can go back to the battle system. And now we don't need this method anymore. And in fact, we actually no longer need this region because this battle system is now simply responsible for delegating down to the current state, which means we now no longer have to keep track of state in an enum, and we can delete this state field and all references to it. We no longer need to check if we're on the player turn. All that matters is that the current state is going to handle these behaviors. So if the current state doesn't implement attack or heal, it's just going to do nothing when those buttons are pressed. But hey, don't take my word for it. Why don't we switch back to the editor and test it out? So we'll hit play. As you can see, a wild opponent has appeared. So that was that begin state. Then it kicks it off into the player turn so I can choose to attack or heal. Now, because the player turn state implements these behaviors. When I hit attack, you can see that actually attack the opponent and it switched over to the enemy. The enemy attacked me. We can do heal. You can see that I feel renewed strength. Works like a charm. And there you have it. Your very first state machine. You know what? I get it now. I think watching you implement it really helped out. Glad to hear it, man. Always happy to help. I really appreciate it, man. And you know what? Now I can start adding new states. Hey, I've got time. If you want to do it now, I can watch and help you out if you run into any problems. Yeah, that's a great idea. Let's do it. All right, so the first thing I should do is create a new class and I'm going to call this yield since it's going to be a yield state. And I'm going to have this class implement the state class that we created. Okay, now I want to switch to the yield state whenever the enemy's health goes below 20%. So that means I'm going to have to set the battle system to this state from the enemy turn state. Now, the enemy turn state only implements the start method, which makes sense. So it's going to have to be somewhere in this logic. But instead of the enemy attacking right away, I'm going to have the enemy check its own health. If the enemy's current health is less than or equal to 20%, of its total health, then we're going to call battle system dot set state and pass in a new yield state. And at this point, I could treat this like a guard clause and I could just yield break to break out of the coroutine. Now, in the yield state, all I'll do is implement the start method and then update the dialog to say that the enemy has yielded. And I'll just worry about adding the extra logic later. So, wow, is that it? I guess we'll switch back to Unity and test it out. Press play. Go ahead and attack. A couple times, we'll get him down to 20%. And then, look at that, the opponent has yielded. Wow, that was actually really easy. That's the power of the state pattern. And don't forget, we're only using a simple implementation. That's right. You know, I really like to read into those more sophisticated implementations that you mentioned earlier. Absolutely. There are plenty of courses and videos you can check out to learn more about it. I'll send you some links. That would be great. Thanks, man. No problem. Anyway, man, I got to get back to work, so I'll catch you later. Sounds good to me. I'll catch you later, man. Special thanks to my top supporters. Berkwist 3D, Dark Rush Photography, NZ, Richard Stance, Thomas, R-Star, and Trond.